The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, this is your moderator, Lori Dearman, with WebAttract, your end-to-end -end solution provider for webinar demand creation. And you're in the right place for Beyond Aerospace, the business case for composites. In just a moment, I'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they share insights on how analysis and predictive testing can help you decide if composites are right for you. We've invited you along with over 650 professionals from 58 countries and 34 states and provinces representing a variety of industries. Regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident you'll find today's webinar of value. Now, speaking of feedback, let's get some from all of you in the way of our first poll. So folks, coming up on your screen is that first poll, and we'd like to know, how is your company using composites? Are you considering how to use them, but you don't currently? Are you using them in some applications, but looking for more effective ways, using composites heavily? Or perhaps you aren't convinced yet the composites will work for you. So go ahead, let us know what you're thinking, and we'll share those out with everybody uh, in just a moment. All right, folks, give you just a moment more to log those votes in on how your company is currently using composites. All right, let's take a look. All right, looks like just about 29% considering how to use them, 38% using in some applications, but looking for more, 14% use composites heavily, and 28% still are not convinced that composites will work for you. Well, the good news is that you're all in the right place. I think there's something for everybody here today. And uh, without further ado, let's get on with our topic. But before we do that, the host of today's webinar is Novel. And I would like to turn it over to Missy Stewart, Marketing Manager at Novel, who'll take just a minute of your time to officially welcome you and express what she hopes you'll get out of today. Missy? Thank you, Lori. I'm excited for Novel to be putting on today's webinar, and I just wanted to quickly share uh, why we're hosting it. If you aren't familiar with Novel, we provide a web-based application for engineers that integrates technical information with analytical and search tools to deliver answers that engineers can trust. Our customers have been telling us that their engineering teams are under pressure to control costs, and uh, all the while they need to complete projects on ever tighter timelines. Composite materials aren't just for aerospace application anymore. Uh, they're providing better solutions for a vast number of designs and everything from pipes to bridges to wind turbines and cars. They have a lot to offer and applied properly. They provide unbeatable weight, strength, and durability advantages, but they're still considered new and sometimes different, and understanding what they are and how they work is essential to getting started. So with our users turning to Novel for best practices and how-to information on redesigning products using composites for uh, improved performance, cost savings, and uh, possibly even faster time to market, we saw an opportunity to pull together a panel on this topic. I trust that uh, the audience will find following this webinar that they have a greater understanding of how composites are being used today, their benefits, and all the trade-offs that you need to consider. I'd like to thank our panelists for all of their hard work and preparation, and I know that everyone will find this session productive. So back to you, Lori. Thank you. Well, thank you, Missy, for the warm welcome and, and for setting the stage for our featured panel, which is comprised of three real thought leaders in this space. I must say that I'm very excited to welcome our featured speakers, Jeff Sloan, Jason Geis, and Dwayne Howell to the webinar today. Now, Jeff will be getting us started with some background and a few unique case study examples of how composites are being used today. But before I pass it over to him, let me say a few words in the way of an introduction. Jeff Sloan has 20 years of experience in manufacturing related B2B trade publications, serving the plastics and composites industry via high performance composites and composites technology magazines and, inject and injection molding and modern plastics magazines. In his current role as editor of High Performance Composites and Composites Technology magazines, Jeff brings his unique background and thought leadership in the composites industry to an audience of 25,000 composite industry professionals each week 
through the Composites World weekly e-newsletter. Jeff is active in SAMPI and Secretary of the SAMPI Rocky Mountain Chapter. He holds a degree in technical journalism. Welcome, Jeff. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks, Lori. It's uh, good to be here. All right. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Lori. And uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on use of composites. Again, my name is Jeff Sloan. I'm the editor of High Performance Composites and Composites Technology Magazines. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the material and uh, how it's applied and give you some examples of recent applications of composites uh, for those who are not as familiar. I'm going to first start with a simple definition. According to the dictionary, a composite is a thing made up of several parts or elements, and we have in our day-to-day -day lives uh, good examples of this. Spaghetti is a one. A chocolate chip cookie is a, another famous example of one. And uh, familiar, of course, to all of us is good old concrete and rebar, which is a well-known composite. But for our purposes today, we're going to spot talk more specifically about composites as a combination of fiber co-cured in a thermoset or thermoplastic resin matrix to create a solid part or structure. And today in the industry, we have several ways of making composite parts. This uh, image that just popped up here is an example of automated tape laying. Another one here is of infusion. That's resin being infused into a glass fiber fabric. This one is pultrusion and another well-known one is compression molding. Okay. Uh, composites are notable for offering high tensile strength and strength modulus, um, corrosion resistance, low CTE, uh, and good fatigue resistance, and of course, light weight. Uh, the global materials market for composites right now is about $17 billion. It's going to go up to $30 billion by 2017. The finished goods market is heading toward $85 billion by 2017. So you can see this is very dynamic in fast-growing market. So what makes composites so great? Um, well, first of all, we divide the market into two sections. Uh, the first is based on carbon fiber, which emphasizes high performance applications like aerospace, auto racing, and sports and recreation. Uh, the other is glass fiber, which emphasizes uh, automotive, marine, industrial markets, wind energy, and infrastructure and construction. These photos show some examples of recent applications of composites ranging from the F-35 fighter plane uh, to the Dodge Viper to the upcoming um, BMW i3 all-electric vehicle, which we'll talk, talk about in a second. Composites' biggest advantage is its um, massive variability, and this is the ability to um, combine different material types, different fiber types, different tooling types, and different manufacturing processes. And in doing this, it allows the user or the manufacturer to meet a variety of uh, mechanical requirements in the finished product. But of course, you can't have an advantage without a disadvantage. And not coincidentally, this same thing that makes composites so great also makes them a challenge in that with so much variation, uh, there's a great deal of, um, there's an opportunity here to do a lot of different things with materials and tooling and processes, but it's also an opportunity to go astray for those who are not as familiar with the material or how, or how to apply it. And so understanding these complexities, how all of these variables work together, is critical uh, to using composites effectively. And that said, there are still a lot of uh, applications, recent applications, that demonstrate pretty clearly how composites can be used effectively. These are some from our public publications that we've recently done stories on that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, the first in the upper left hand corner here is a BMW i3 chassis which I just mentioned. This is an all-electric vehicle. It's due out in 2013. This represents the first production vehicle to use carbon fiber in the chassis. Uh, it's a major uh, stepping stone and a paradigm shift for the automotive industry and should be very interesting. Uh, to see how this leads other automakers uh, to, into similar projects and efforts. Next below that we find a spare tire well for an Audi vehicle. This, replace, this is a uh, metal replacement part and it's a, also a consolidation. It went from 15 parts to one, uh, cut capital investment cost by 70%, cut part cost by 30%, and uh, offered tremendous weight savings. Uh, below that here is another example. Uh, the Navy was having a problem with its uh, inflatable boats. Uh, soldiers were actually suffering injury from uh, wave shock in these boats. They turned to composites to develop a uh, super lightweight and flexible skin for these boats. 
Uh, they saved weight, uh, uh, had weight savings of about 25%, increased payload capacity, and cut their G loads uh, significantly. Uh, another example here is buried pipe. This application is in uh, Saudi Arabia, and we're dealing here, of course, with temperature and pressure buried pipe uh, under the sand. Um, design here is a significant uh, part of the project in that these this pipe, these large structures, had to be uh, designed in such a way to withstand the pressures and the temperatures and composites uh, easily met the requirements for this project. Another fast-growing segment of the industry on the right side here is composite rebar. Uh, this is very appealing because unlike uh, metallic rebar, composite rebar resists corrosion and offers a very high tensile strength and we're seeing a lot of interest, interest in composites in this application. And finally, we go to, on the bottom here, the bottom right, we go to a construction application. This is a museum facade in the Netherlands. Very interesting. This is a 100 meter long uh, wall in the museum. It's made with aramid, carbon fiber, and vinyl ester. Uh, and composites here was able to meet a variety of coefficient of thermal expansion challenges. So if you're considering use of composites, it's very likely that you're looking at composites as a replacement for a traditional mirror material like metal, wood, or concrete. And when this happens, we usually encounter what's called black metal, where the composite is replacing the traditional material without significant changes in design. But ultimately, of course, the uh, goal is to redesign the structure to take full advantage of composites' physical properties. And we're actually seeing some of this take place today in the aerospace industry. Uh, the Boeing 777, for example, was introduced to the market in 1995. It looks not unlike the Boeing 787, which was uh, introduced to us last year. Of course, the top plane is mostly aluminum. Uh, the bottom plane there is mostly composites. Um, and so we see not significant design changes from one to the other. But it's possible in the next 15 or 20 years, we could see more design changes made possible by composites. And these are two aircraft that Boeing is evaluating. And these designs are made possible in part because of the use of composites. So these are examples of how composites can evolve uh, a design. In any case, the complexity of, complexities of composites demand that uh, the user and the manufacturer have a good understanding of how material and tooling and manufacturing work together. And so it's hoped that uh, this presentation today uh, will help you understand the fundamental complexities of this material and how best to approach design optimization. So that brings me to the end of my introduction. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of this presentation. I will turn everything back over to Lori. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate it. And uh, again, don't go too far. We will be having you back for the Q&A. But uh, thank you very much for setting the stage. Our next speaker, Jason, uh, will be talking to us about the analysis of composites. But before I pass it over to him, let me say a few words in the way of an introduction. So Jason Geis, in his role at Firehole Composites, uh, as Firehole Composites VP, interacts with engineers and designers, analysts, managers, and executives across multiple industries to enable successful use of composite materials. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering and has professional associations with SAMPI, AIAA, and ASME. Welcome, Jason. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Lori. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks to the team that worked on the webinar. What's so interesting with composites is how much there really is to learn and, and the unique things that everyone brings to the table. So I appreciate everyone's time and input in preparing for this event. Absolutely. And Jason, before you delve into the topic at hand, could you say a few words about how Firehole works with composites? Absolutely. So we're an engineering uh, software company. We provide both commercial solutions and custom software, and we also do consulting. But really the point is, is that we're involved with composites, how to apply them, and how to best analyze them. And so that's really going to be my focus today in terms of what we bring to the table. We've got a handful of commercial tools. And then finally, the name Firehole, it's a, it's a question we commonly get. We're a Wyoming-based company. The Firehole River is a famous river in Yellowstone National Park, so that's just a, a quick reference to our roots, if you will. So if I may, I'd like to use this example, and you may or may not have seen it before, but this is the first iron bridge ever constructed. And ironically, it's in a town named Iron Bridge. But here on the right, we see uh, some technology that, that goes back to 
construction with wood materials, dovetail joints, and, and what had occurred was methodologies that were used and comfortable at the time were extended to this new material. And I think this is a great paradigm to draw between where we are at now with composites and how simulation can help increase our productivity and our understanding of how these materials performed. And so that's the fact that we have these new materials, how do we deal with them maybe in a different way to, to optimize their performance. And just to reiterate what Jeff talked about earlier, composites bring a lot of really fantastic properties to the table. We get improved efficiency and reliability. You can see just in this schematic the difference when you look across from weight all the way through to fatigue resistance. The improved performance composites can bring to the table. So let's talk about why we should consider composites. And I've got a picture of the spork here and that's really something that comes to mind in, in how are composites the best of both worlds. They're directional materials, so the directional nature allows us to take advantage of their performance and tailor their response. And so there's several ways we can tailor this response or what we can focus on, including strength and stiffness, how they respond to various environmental conditions, and then specifically one of those being thermal expansion. So <clears throat> when we're talking about what else can be beneficial, we have the opportunity to potentially ta tailor the failure modes of the composite structure. And at first you may say, well, how is that beneficial? But I think what we can offer with composites is the ability to understand how different designs perform and maybe how we want to see not if failure happens, but when it does eventually happen, how that failure should occur. And so these are just three quick examples. And on the very right, we've got a, a bearing type failure. And for this application, it allowed for a more, more gradual rather than a catastrophic failure. And that's something that could be detected with an in-service inspection program, et cetera. So having said that, we know that composites are great. There's also some unique challenges and the reason why everyone doesn't just jump on the composites wagon. And these include expense. And that expense can be raw material. It can have to do with the design or the design process maybe how you manufacture the parts. Jeff alluded to this uh, earlier, but we, we have infinite possibilities that can be an advantage and we have infinite possibilities that can make it difficult sometimes to engineer or can be overwhelming. Along with that, there can be different manufacturing techniques beyond what a lot of people in the traditional metals world are used to. And depending on the industry, the part, etc., composites can be testing intensive how we qualify materials and subcomponents, etc. So let's talk about why we should simulate composite materials. You know, Firehole being a software company, this is really our niche and something we believe in deeply about how we can bring smarter and more detailed information to composite designs. So what I've depicted here is, is the idea of large structural components and the testing process and how the idea of virtual testing, whether it be through FEA simulation, some other software tools, uh, any sorts of engineering calculations. But what we have on the right is a very large test frame. It's an expensive component and it's an expensive testing situation. And you can see in the middle, this is, this is a spaceflight qualified hardware. It's about the size of, of a man. And what virtual testing can do on the left is it can help us lower the testing costs by getting a better understanding of how the, the particular designs will perform, how they will behave, what sort of obstacles we, look, we need to look out for, so that when we are testing, not that testing is going to go away, but that when we are testing, we're testing structures that we really think are further down the road and it isn't such a surprise as to how they perform or what they're going to do in the test environment. So I've just got a couple more minutes. I wanted to talk about some unique case studies going beyond aerospace, highlighting where and how composites have been used and what simulation can bring to the table. So here we've got an underwater tidal turbine, kind of a unique composite application. This is a corrosion, a high corrosion environment. We're at the bottom of the ocean. And we're also in a situation where it's very difficult to conduct regular and continuous in-service inspections and maintenance. So we want to make sure that the design is robust, 
has the acceptable safety margins, it can handle the environment. To give you an idea of this turbine, from one end to the other we're almost 100 feet and the structure sits about 30 feet off of the ocean floor. So it's a large composite structure and this is a really neat project that just wrapped up. Uh, ORPC began producing electricity with this design in September of this year. The sporting goods industry has really latched onto composites. I think that they provide some really unique capabilities. In this case, we, we worked with the company Bauer Hockey and helped them understand different materials and how they could help the performance of their hockey sticks, used simulation to provide virtual trade studies, and then something unique in this market is, is the idea of player feedback, this qualitative feedback. How can we tie that to performance or behavior we see in the analysis? So I've got a quick video. I hope my video plays. There we go. So this is a slow motion of a, of a slap shot. Here we can see the extremely high deflection that the stick sees. And the point of this is this is really a, a complex nonlinear composite problem. So it's a great application for simulation. There's a lot going on here. And so in this case, a bunch of virtual prototypes were investigated. It allowed the customer to understand the impact of different materials, different orientations, and associated with that are cost trade studies, whether it's the manufacturing or the individual materials. And then finally, one of the things that came about was the idea of stick softening, or how players noted that a, as the stick was used on the ice, that the feel changed and so simulation was used to help idealize and show what was going on and give them better insight into how to either avoid that or enhance that feedback. The final example I've got today is wind turbine blade. We're, in Wyoming we see a huge boom in the installations of these structures out here. It's an interesting time in the wind industry and I think it's important to talk about some of the unique design considerations that an engineer dealing with these structures has. The idea of a 50-year wind, that is, what is the largest wind in a 50-year time period that the structure is going to see? And then these structures are, are large and they're generally not manufactured where they're going to be installed, so we have transportation loading and issues. We also have manufacturing issues. To give you an idea of the blade size that we're seeing, a 75-meter blade, which equates to about 155-meter rotor diameter, is is becoming more common and so this is a very large composite structure how do we get it there how do we set it up how does it maintain its in-service ability so to give you an idea of the complex 3d loading that a blade sees we've got rotation we've got wind load and gravity makes for a unique composite application and a unique analysis situation so I've got another video here and this is uh, a video of a test blade that went underwent a failure and just to give you an idea of how catastrophic this can be. So what we see here is is there there are several things going on but at the end of the day we've got an issue with the design or the manufacturing or something with this composite part. And in this case it was a faulty design and it cost a lot of money in retrofit costs. The point is here is also a situation where simulation can come to play. Simulation of these structures can be really important, not only before the design, but there's often unknowns. We can use it in the forensic sense, understanding the performance and, and how to avoid that situation in the future. So I appreciate the time and the ability to present some of these ideas, and I'll pass it back to you, Lori. All right. Thanks so much, Jason. And again, we'll be having you back at the end. Next, we have Dwayne Howell, President uh, and owner of Peak Composites, Inc. Dwayne has 24, 24 years experience in the design, analysis, development, and fabrication of composite structures. He's authored nine technical papers that have been published in the Sampy Journal and various conference proceedings. Mr. Howell is the author of Composites Pro Software, which is used worldwide and has been the leading composite software package in its category since 1996. He holds an aerospace engineering degree from the University of Cincinnati. So, Dwayne, welcome. How are you doing today? 
I'm doing great. Thank you, Lori. All right. And uh, folks, Dwayne will be sharing with us a case study example that takes us through the decision-making process that one company went through in deciding whether or not using a composite was right for them. So with that, over to you, Dwayne. All right. Thanks again. All right. What, what I'm going to do today is to kind of... Uh, delve into some more detail on the things that Jeff and Jason have already discussed, some of the, the higher items there, but I'm going to delve into more detail here. And to start off with any structure that we you would be designing or analyzing, any products you want to fabricate, this process I have on the screen here, this design and analysis process is applicable for any material. It, uh, it involves an iteration between analysis and design. You come up with an idea, you do some analysis on that to see if you have the right thickness, the right material, the right temperature, the right environment, or the right cost. And then that goes back and forth until you finally get the one that works and you end up with your product. In our particular case, materials are our focus uh, since these are composites, although all this still feeds into that. The case study I want to present today is on a robotic pedestal. It's, a, it's a, basically a support for a robot that goes inside of a data library. Now this library is one that holds uh, 6,000 data uh, storage devices along the walls of the library. And this robot spins around inside of there, grabs those cartridges off the wall, puts them in drives to read and write data. And this has to be done very fast. And the pedestal that the robot sits on has to be able to maintain uh, the position of this, these robotic arms so that they can accurately take in place. And that's where the composites come in. Well, the problem with the current existing system, because when we came in it was a retrofit now, and it's not to make it better. All right? The problem with the system was it was heavy. The, the aluminum base, as it shows kind of a schematic here with the fins on it, that base is very heavy. It took a long time to make these parts. There were aluminum castings that required a lot of machining, and that was time consuming. As a result of that machining, it was a very high price. So the idea was to get the price down a little bit more as well. And to top it all off, the performance of it was pretty mediocre. The design was such that the torsional vibration frequency of the robot started and stopped because it spins on this axis as it started and stopped, would vary greatly between one pedestal and another, so it's very hard to tune the system to accurately uh, make it perform well. So weight was a critical issue on this, as I've already said. So what could we do about that? Well, this chart here kind of shows a comparison with the different times, types of composite materials. we got carbon materials, there's various grades, uh, Kevlar, fiberglass, S2, or E-glass here, compared to metals on the right. Now, aluminum was um, uh, the, is what the current uh, incumbent base is made of, and its density is about 0.1 pounds per cubic inch. Whereas any of the composites, you can see E-glass all the way up to ultra high modulus are lower than that. In particular, standard modulus carbon is pretty good and it's, it's lower. So the, a, a good thing to do would be to just pick one of these composite materials to get the weight down. Well, it's not just about weight. It's also about its performance in terms of stiffness. Now stiffness is it's the modulus, modulus of elasticity of the material, uh, how much it stretches or doesn't stretch under load. And that, for the aluminum, is around a 10 MSI, uh, millions of pounds per square inch, whereas for standard modulus carbon, it, you get double for that. And look at E-glass. E-glass is, is a little le is less than the aluminum, so you see by using different grades of material, you can go from a very low modulus to a high modulus, which makes it stiffer, deflecting less under load, which is important for vibration. Can't forget, though, about cost. Aluminum, just raw aluminum, say is on the order of $5 per pound. That's pretty cheap compared to Look at the carbon materials. All the carbons are, are pretty far up there, I mean way up there for ultra high modulus carbon uh, on the left. But if you look at standard modulus carbon, it's one of the lowest economic grades of carbon at $12 a pound. That's still more than $5 a pound for aluminum. In fact, if this could be made out of sheet metal, which I'll talk about in a little while, if this could be made out of sheet metal, it could be just $1 a pound. So cost can be misleading on this. You might look at this and say, I forget composites, that price is just too high. But with some of the other advantages of stiffness, uh, of lightweight, and being able to reduce the amount of material used, it can actually be a winner on cost as well. So although this library pedestal, the support pedestal, was not really important as far as its uh, strength goes, it wasn't really a strength-driven product, more stiffness-driven, deflection-driven, you can take a look here at what this might be for an application you would have. So, for example, composite strengths are way up there for material that has all fiber oriented in one direction, unidirectional material, compared to aluminum, steel, titanium. Uh, it, it, this, this, not much can be said here other than the fact that it is just incredible what composites can do strength-wise, even fiberglass materials. 
at the 150, so it's, it's twice what it is for aluminum. Now, in order to make a composite structure work properly, we've got to consider everything about it, all of its loads that are on the structure um, and its environment, all of everything I talked about right at the very beginning. This particular application has a torsional load requirement. Now, it does have a compression load from gravity. That's, that's, that's a nit compared to the torsional load in this due to the fast starts and stops of this robot as it spins. So in our analysis, we have to take that into account. And we're going to do analysis. We're not just going to build and test. We're going to do analysis to save us a lot of money, a lot of time getting products to market. And there are analysis tools out there that will help us do that. Now, through the analysis, where we arranged on the bottom left here, you can see the layup that the kind of stacking sequence to create a laminate. Now, laminate is just taking unidirectional plies of material where all fibers in one direction, stacking those up at different angles, and you end up with a laminate. Now, this laminate has a unique set of material properties as far as its strength, its stiffness, etc. And we have to design that laminate to best perform under the load conditions for the product. In this case, it turned out a plus minus 45 degree laminate works best for this application, which makes sense. That's going to be the best laminate to handle torsional loading in a conical shaped structure. Now something we need to think about as we move forward here, and, and Jeff already alluded to this, when you're talking about a composite material, the best time to introduce composites into your product is as you start designing it. Not when you've already got it made of metals and you're trying to go back and replace it, although that's possible and that's exactly what we did on this, this support pedestal, but the best time to take the maximum advantage of the material is to do this in your design phase. And you've got to, it's just absolutely positively necessary to consider the design, the analysis, and fabrication as a, as a loop, as, as, as one entity, because you've got to think of all these things together. You can't just toss the design over the wall anymore. Uh, I know this is true for other industries as well, not just composites, but it's so much more critical when it comes to composites itself. In fact, it's so critical, I want to take just a minute here and talk about some of the uh, different uh, fabrication methods that are out there for us to use, because these methods uh, will produce a different kind of part depending on the method you use. The first one here is just hand layup. Now hand layup is just what it sounds like. You take material that's a composite uh, fabric material so to speak, in this example here in these pictures, that's been pre-impregnated with resin so it's got the resin already in there, maybe it's sticky because it's got some epoxy resin in there. And you form that into the, shape, into the tool that you're trying to, uh, to, to build the part from. As you can see, the geometries on this are pretty limitless. This is a this is a, a, a wall saw here that you see totally made of carbon fiber composites. So it's pretty limitless as far as the shapes you can do. However, it's very slow. Hand lift is very slow, time consuming, can be kind of pricey. Another method that's faster would be filament winding. Now filament winding is a process where you take a tool, a mandrel on a spindle that's rotating, and it pulls fiber, uh, resin impregnated fiber onto that mandrel, wraps it around it great for bodies of revolution. We're talking pressure vessels, we're talking tubes, uh, uh, anything anything like that that's a body of revolution. And you can put down a lot of material in a short amount of time. So it's a very economical way. And you can start with raw materials too. Just uh, liquid resin and dry fiber and combine those two right before it goes on to the part, as you see in this photo up to the left. So filament wine is great. Uh, Vardam. Now this might, the Vardam is va vacuum uh, assisted resin transfer molding. Now the application I actually show here is more of a VARI, V-A-R-I, vacuum assisted resin infusion, not to be more accurate as far as the pictures I show. But both these processes start with, up in the right corner here, a, a tool, a mold. This is a huge mold of a bus, uh, bus body. And you lay uh, fabric into that, dry fabric, dry composite materials into that. Uh, you put a, a vacuum egg on there to kind of encapsulate it. Uh, and then you inject resin. You pull resin in through vacuum, and it totally infiltrates the, the laminate, and it cures under its catalytic reaction. And you end up with the bus body I, sh I show right here. So it's great for making large parts, uh, and the, the, the tooling can be low cost because it uses composite tooling. Another method is fiber placement. Now, fiber placement may be more reserved for the aerospace kinds of products because the equipment is very, very expensive. And this takes toes of material, just strings of material, like filament winding but it places that on under, under force and compaction and it can follow contours in, you know, concave and convex contours can make complex structures. It's kind of slow in its process as far as how, how fast it can build parts, but it's very repeatable. And you can do that the same every time. And for the aerospace industry, this is very important and probably for other industries, but material cost is going to be limiting, but great for aerospace applications. Thermoforming. This is an, this is an example between uh, the comparison of thermosets and thermoplastic resin systems. Thermoset systems 
are basically liquid resins. They have a catalytic reaction which combine and cross link molecules to harden the structure. Whereas for a thermoformed application with a uh, thermoplastic material, the material is already hard at room temperature. It's a thermoplastic. To get it to form, you have to melt it, heat it up and melt it, and then form the part through a pressing operation. And when it cools, the part solidifies again. There's no chemical reactions, no cross-linking. It is just a, a quick stamping operation once the material is heated. And that's the beauty of this. You can Cycle times on parts are, are less, or can be less than one minute per part to form a stamped part. Just think of sheet metal stamping, kind of like that. But to form a, sheet, uh, uh, a stamped part, less than a minute, this is absolutely great for automotive applications or parts where you need tens of thousands of parts per year. This can be the answer for you. Finally, in my examples of, these aren't all the examples now, there's plenty of other ones, but I'm giving you the main ones here. Pultrusion is another process that, you, that can be considered. And this process is a, where you take fiber and resin, you pull it through a dye, and it's going through the dye, the resin is cured, and you get a constant cross-section kind of a part, like an I-beam or, or a C-channel. Uh, these ladder rails on this ladder depicted here are produced with this process. So it's great for high production, uh, constant cross-section parts. So you can see these different manufacturing processes got to be considered as you're thinking about your product, your design, so that you can know how to make the part because each process has some limitations to it. Now for our part we're talking about here, this, this back to the pedestal. Now the pedestal, we chose filament winding as the most efficient, best way to make this product. You can see from the picture we've got two mandrels at one time and they're back-to-back -back pedestals. So in this, in this picture here we're making four at one time on a filament winding machine. Uh, that gets us low cost and we can do some high production rates out of that. The total process to make these parts involve the winding, what we call vacuum bagging like I described earlier to, to, to uh, be able to apply pressure, uh, actual pressure to the part during cure. We cure it in an oven, we do a trim operation, and then finally we do a bonding operation. And this is really key to make this part successful. We were able to bond aluminum flanges top and bottom of this pedestal at a very precise um, uh, relationship to each other. So the parallelism was, was right on, was very tight. And that totally eliminated any machining to be done on the part. And finally, there's a QC step to make sure we're in the right frequency range of the parts. So the solution. The solution of this part involved the idea of light weighting. We were able to take this thing, this pedestal, down from 150 pounds down to 45 pounds. That's quite an inc a decrease in, in, in weight on order of 70%. We decreased the production times by being able to make multiple parts at one time in a filament winding machine, unlike the casting operations of, of aluminum. We were able to get the cost down from a, basically a $1,000 pedestal down to a $700 pedestal, so a 30% price reduction. And the performance improved. We used a high stiffness uh, carbon fiber composite material, and that greatly improved the torsional vibration characteristics of the part as the, the cone is a much more efficient structure than a tube with fins on it like the aluminum uh, casting and it was able to make a light, nice tight range of frequency of vibration so, there, so when this robot was in action it didn't shut down because things weren't tuned properly. Carbon fiber composites were the answer to this industrial application. This isn't aerospace, uh, this, this isn't commercial, this is more of an industrial application. So the solution there took us to other realized benefits that you know, on the surface were not what we thought we would get out of it but because we went to a composite pedestal, we were able to uh, also beat out a steel pedestal. Steel, remember back earlier, $1 a pound material. So as we were designing this pedestal, a competitor was also designing a replacement pedestal for this, pro this, this product line that used sheet metal, bent sheet metal, welded along an edge with a welded cap on it, a uh, flange uh, on, on that. So that, so that, but they had to keep it very thin in order to keep the weight down. Steel weighs, you know, twice as, you know, more twice as much heavier than, than uh, is composite materials. So they, they had to keep it very thin. Well, doing that, when they did the welding, it disturbed the, the alignment of the top and bottom flanges of this part. They had to go in and machine it now to make it work. Machining added cost and time. The steel part cost more than our composite part. It was more than $700 to make that part. So a realized benefit even over steel. <clears throat> Transportation was a realized benefit. That, that light weight, that 70% reduction in weight allowed for, for lighter weight transportation costs to uh, put more weight on the truck. During the install of the part, the used to be able to, you'd have to send out two installers out to, to even move the pedestal around and get it into position and do everything. Now with a part that is this light, it took one installer to do this. So we could actually install at a lower cost. All these things together were, were 
you know, we didn't realize these were, these were going to happen, but there were extra things that came out of this that you would maybe wouldn't realize at first. And let's see, go down here, side stuff. All right, finally, what can composites do for you? The idea here is composites offer lightweight, high strength, high stiffness, part consolidation, corrosion resistance, all these things that can they can sometimes get you in a cost benefit, but sometimes it's just a performance benefit that even is related to cost. One example here, and I'll and I'll close with this. The bridge you see at the bottom. This bridge is a uh, uh, a composite bridge. They're able to put this in place very rapidly, unlike traditional ways of installing bridges. The downtime on the highway is less, and the corrosion issue is out of the picture now. So corrosion is out of the picture. The bridge lasts longer. So overall, life cycle costs have been reduced for this bridge. Uh, Lori, that includes my presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Dwayne. That was fabulous. And folks, we are going to be getting to the questions that are coming in the queue. See a couple. Uh, coming in already. Thank you. And uh, go ahead and add to them. We will be getting to them momentarily. I'm going to launch our second and final poll for today. would like to hear from all of you. What are the properties or benefits you are most interested in? And in this case, you can select all that apply. So if it's more than one, corrosion control, improved component safety, longer product life cycle, durability, cost savings, strength, lightweight. Yeah, go ahead and let us know. And Let's take a look at uh, the poll response. See if uh, others are thinking the same way that you are. We've got about 51% uh, saying corrosion control, 24% improved component safety, 57% longer product life cycle or durability, 68% cost savings, and it looks like the, the uh, Winner here today, strength and lightweight, 83%. So thank you for the input there. It's very insightful. And with that, I would like to bring all three of our panelists back to the virtual podium, if you will. And we'll go ahead and get started with some of the fabulous questions that are coming in. Uh, first one over to you, Jason, and that is, are there codes and standards available for composites? That's a good question, Lori. You know, the the point of this webinar was to go beyond aerospace, but I think that 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 doesn't mean that we can't learn things from aerospace. And one one thing that really is is predominant in the aerospace industry is the the CMH 17 or what was formerly called Mill Handbook 17, and this was really guidance for how to use composites, what sort of properties are involved. It's a great reference material. It's really common in aerospace and I think it's something worth looking at depending on your industry and what you're trying to do with composites. There's a couple others. ASME in the composite pressure vessel world has some regulations and some guidelines for how to design composites. Um, you know, it's really going to be industry specific. For instance, the marine industry has the DNV specifications. And then really, I think finally that there are several composite organizations that will help if people have questions about, well, I'm in industry XYZ. How do I find out more information? SAMPI is one, the Society of Advanced Materials and Process Engineering, AIAA, which is an aerospace specific. The ACMA is a manufacturing industry. And, uh, and I think there are several more, but those are the ones that jump out. So hopefully that answers that question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Over to you, Dwayne. And Lee's asking, how critical is the resin for making a composite? Well, the uh, resin system is actually quite critical. It is what defines the composite shape. The fiber gives us all the, the strength and reinforcement, stiffness, but the resin defines the shape. Now, not only that, the choice of resin systems helps too. Uh, there are epoxies that can handle higher temperatures. There are polyesters, for example, that are low temperature applications. I don't low. I mean, I mean, not not very hot temperature applications, but are a lot lower costs. The interface between the fiber and the resin, how those how those come together, how those uh, adhere to each other, uh, can be a detractor. So that that has to be uh, paid attention to on which which fibers work best with which resin systems. So it's very important as far as the type of resin that is used for environmental conditions uh, and for adhesion to the fiber. Okay, thanks so much. This one uh, over to you, Jeff, and Matthew's asking, when will the industry see a five pound carbon fiber and a two minute and two minute cycle times? 
Okay, thanks. Uh, that's a good question. Actually, the, the cycle time question is being answered even today. A uh, carbon fiber manufacturer in Japan called Tejian announced actually yesterday uh, that they are launching a pilot plant for the development of a one minute cycle time uh, manufacturing process for a thermoplastic composite uh, process using carbon fiber. They're doing this primarily for automotive and I think it's using compression molding. Uh, Tejian is not being very forthcoming about how they're doing this, uh, but they, a few po folks I've talked to have assured me that it is being done. So that's coming right now. And Tejian is actually cooperating with General Motors in Detroit to develop this for some future GM cars. So that uh, that is here, uh, and it seems to be working its way into production probably with you in the next five years, I'm going to guess. The $5 uh, per pound carbon fiber, that's the elusive uh, goal, holy grail for the industry. I don't know if we'll ever actually see that. I think the benefits for carbon fiber are going to come from the uh, from the total cost side that uh, Jason and Dwayne outlined uh, and part consolidation and light weighting and other things. Um, I, I think it remains to be seen here in the next few years where the price goes, but I, there's a great deal of um, uncertainty about whether or not we'll ever actually see $5 carbon fiber. Jason, uh, James is asking for the composite underwater turbine that you described earlier in the presentation. Does the material of the composite render it less prone to marine growth versus steel or about the same or more? That's a really interesting question, James. And the short answer is I'm, I'm not sure. ORPC, Ocean Renewable Power, used, I believe it was a, an epoxy or a series of epoxy coatings on the outside of that structure. So that's that's a question I'm going to follow up with you direct on after the webinar. I'm going to reach out to my contacts at ORPC. I know that the overall environment that that part sees and how it performs versus metallic structures was vastly improved, but specific to marine, marine growth, I, I don't know the answer to that right now. OK. Wonderful. And uh, Dwayne. Nicholas is asking, in the industrial application, composites can be used for corrosive exhaust ducts. However, they usually require fire suppression and tend to be heavier than stainless steel ducts. How do you keep cost and weight down? That's, an, that's another great question. And first of all, composites are not always the answer to, the, to every question. So you have to look at the best material for the best, at best application. A way to perhaps approach this on uh, for fire retardants is many many of the epoxies or whatever other resin systems out there. You, there's additives that can be put into those systems to make them fire retardant. In fact, probably one of the best ones that is inherently so uh, would be a phenolic system. Now, phenolics are relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can uh, the material would be uh, a fiberglass as far as construction, fiberglass phenolic construction as far as resin and fiber, and that that might be the best for a fire suppression application. And that's where that best I could probably answer that question now. Okay, Jason, another one here for you from Eric. Could you comment on the characterization of composite material systems for predictive purposes? What properties are critical? This is a really common question on the simulation side. I think that depending on what you're trying to do with your analysis, if you're using classic laminate theory or sort of a closed form approach, you can really have a subset of the properties I'm going to talk about in a second. There's some assumptions that can be made. I think the, the, the old adage of garbage in, garbage out is really important to, to keep in mind here. Where we're getting that data, manufacturers, research publications and journal articles, etc. But really on the FEA side, I like to think of lamina, that's the single ply, stiffness and strengths of the composite, and the fiber volume. All right. This one uh, for you, Jeff, from Rajaram. And Rajaram, I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your name correctly. The question is, how can composites compete with steel for protection covers for subsea applications? Uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, we've documented in the last couple of years several applications where uh, composites have replaced steel in subsea applications. A notable one is on the um, Virginia class submarines. 
uh, if you actually go to our website, you can search this and find the article. But uh, what the Navy did was they needed to replace some of the steel covers on the uh, mast. The mast is the part of the submarine that, that protrudes from the top of the, the main part of the submarine and allows access in and out of the craft. Um, the Navy was looking to reduce some weight and wanted to replace some steel covers there and did it with composites pretty handily. It saved weight. Of course, corrosion is the big deal there and in subsea applications, composites perform real well. Uh, Jason alluded to um, the uh, underwater tidal turbine. Uh, we also had an article recently about another underwater tidal turbine in Europe uh, that had to meet several um, corrosion uh, and dynamic force requirements and is doing very well in that application as well. So I think you'll find that um, there are several examples where, where composites have worked in replacing steel uh, pretty handily in, in subsea applications. This one for Duane. And it's from Elias. Again, sincere apologies if I've mispronounced your name, Elias. And it looks like a, a follow-up from a previous question. You did not mention the resin selection. What are the criteria for the best properties? Okay, there's there's actually a table that I have that was not in this presentation. But the uh, resin selection is based upon your environment and strength and cost. So it's it comes down to those those three main ones, okay? And if, uh, like like I said earlier, epoxies are probably the premium uh, ones for for applications in composites. You get down into the polyesters, the urethanes. You're talking uh, applications that are not as not as intense, not as aerospace, so to speak, okay? That are more commercial industrial applications that can use those uh, materials. Now, if you're talking thermoplastics uh, rather than thermosets, those resins there, there there's across the board. There can be uh, you know polyurethanes uh, as well, polyesters that give you they're like one dollar a pound materials, okay. And you mix some fiber with that that costs a buck a pound. You can, you have a very low cost composite, and but if you have issues with strength because polyester is not a good strength, now you got to get up into materials like uh, peak uh, thermoplastics. Now peak thermoplastics are very strong, uh, but they're you know they're, we're talking you know sixty seventy dollars a pound for that material, but it's it is it is probably the most resistant to chemical. Uh, an environment that you can have out there for a thermoplastic. So it, it yes, selection and the criteria, the best properties. It depends. It, it depends on the resin system. There are there are tables that exist out there, and maybe we could follow up. I could just send you with that. Send you that table. Perfect. Jeff, over to you. Travis has posted. My company is working on a project in Liberia for a water system. I noticed earlier that you mentioned the success of composites for large underground pipes in high pressure and temperature conditions. Have composites been used for smaller diameter water systems and would you expect either greater durability or reduced cost in such an application when compared with traditional PVC or DI pipes? Well, that's a good question. Um, we haven't done any stories recently on specific use of small diameter composite pipe and water systems, but I, we have done uh, several stories on the use of composite pipes uh, in oil and gas exploration, and uh, this would be a similar application. We're dealing with high pressure, corrosive environment, uh, a very dynamic uh, mechanical environment, and composites have, over the last 10 years, gradually moved into this space pretty handily. Um, the lightweight of composites, their their durability, um, their high strength have all been uh, very appealing to the oil and gas industry, and so we've seen a lot of application there. Uh, another application you might look at is desalination. Uh, this is a very fast-growing market. Obviously, the supply of fresh water to large populations is critical, and composites are seeing a lot of use in these applications as well. So, um, yeah, I would say what, what you find for large pipes also applies to small pipes, and uh, we're seeing in oil and gas and in water um, use of composites. Okay, Dwayne, uh, Edwin would like to know in regards to sustainability, can any of these composites be recycled? All right, there's, there's different ways to do this, and recycling is, uh, it's, it's, it is an issue. You just don't take a go down to the junkyard with steel like in a car and and melt that back down and reuse it again. It's, you, you can't do that in most cases. So there's really two, 
two main categories of things you can do. If it's a thermoset uh, product, you know, you've had resin crosslinking, you have a chemical change, you're not going to melt that down. That's not going to happen. But what you can do, and what I've seen done, is that material can be taken and perhaps uh, chopped up, you know, an old composite part taken and chopped up and used as a, as a filler in, in making more composite parts with, with uh, you know, virgin material again. So perhaps that's a way to perhaps that's a way to do it. And I've even seen applications where the waste when you're fabricating uh, thermoset composite parts, where you have scrap material during your fabrication that's still uncured, you can take that and recycle that into uh, to make just a panel out of this chopped fiber uh, panels that can be used to you know just the cell for just regular panel applications, whatever that might be. Now, if you're talking a thermoplastic system, it's different now. Thermoplastics can be remelted and reused. And the, the challenge there is going to be taking those materials and separating the fiber from the resin and, and the techniques to do that. But, but ultimately, those are, the, those are recyclable materials since they can be uh, remelted again. And just as far as the world stage goes, uh, the Europeans are very much in tune with that. And thermoplastics are more in use over there because of that recyclability, whereas uh, here in the United States, it's, it's becoming more useful uh, in that regard. Well, thank you very much. And uh, folks, we are rubbing up against the top of the hour. So that's going to have to be the last uh, question for Q&A today. But uh, there are a number of great questions still in the queue. If we didn't get to yours, you can expect an answer within a week. In the meantime, we'd love to hear from you and continue the conversation. So let's go over a few options where you can do just that. On Facebook, uh, you can go out to www.facebook.com forward slash novel, uh, like our fan page and to comment, uh, like our fan page in order to comment on posts about this particular webinar. Also on Twitter, again, it's pound K webinar. You can learn more about novel at the novel website, novel.com. Also about firehole composites at firehole.com and as well composites world at compositesworld.com. We will be sending these links over to you in the chat, so uh, you'll have them handy. And folks, before you sign off, we'd like to thank each of you for joining us and trust that you found today to be of value. And of course, special thanks to Jeff Sloan, Jason Geis, and Dwayne Howell, and our sponsors, Novel Firehole Composite, Novel and Firehole Composites, as well as Composites World. You'll be receiving a short survey at the end of this webinar. We really would appreciate you taking a moment to fill it out. Also, a quick thank you to our logistics producer in the background there, Patty Van Huser, for her behind-the-scenes collaboration and support. Again, a copy of today's web webcast will be available for download, and you'll be receiving it in the way of a link from us early next week. And most importantly, thank you for joining us. And as your moderator, this is Lori Dearman saying have a great rest of the week. Bye for now. <laughs>